Hey everybody, let's do a quick run through of Big Idea 5, Impact of Computing. This topic has a lot of different elements to it, and we'll break them down into different sections, but this really is about the kind of results of using computers. What happens in society as a result of using all this stuff that we've learned, like data, uh, networks, the legal implications, the ethical implications. This is kind of the end result of how computers affect us. And so there's going to be a few different topics we'll look at. So I want to cover this uh, fairly quickly. I don't want to take too much time, but this is meant to be a review. So, and hopefully at the end we'll get to some uh, questions. The impact of technology. So this was the first message, if you remember back way back we looked at morse code this was the first message what hath god wrought meaning what what has come about what what has technology done like what has come about because of uh the things that we've done so it's kind of like this has been a question about that we've thought about uh, for a long time what is te this new technology going to do and it does change the world even like simple little things can have a big impact so, often it's for good, not always though. So, for example, uh, here's an example of the impact of social media. If you look at the difference between social media use and depression, this is a study that was done in the UK, and it found that depression increased with more use on social media, and different uh, groups were affected in different ways. So it seems like girls were affected more than boys uh, with their level of social media use. So in this sense, uh, we can see that like while it might be good to keep in touch with friends and uh, you know know about the latest stuff like kind of news that you're interested in, it can also have negative effects. And so we have to be aware of them so that we can stop them from hurting us or impacting us too much. Right, now, obviously, there is uh, AI is one of the newest ones that we'll be talking about. This course doesn't cover AI that much. And for many of you, may you may be aware of what AI is. Maybe you just think it's this magical machine that can tell you stuff. It's kind of like having autocomplete, but it's like autocomplete on steroids. It responds in ways which are more detailed, but it completes things which should come next, right? In order gives you the best answer based on its training. But AI is going to become more and more of a feature of our world in the future where it can um, maybe even replace some industries or jobs. And so that's going to be a huge impact on our world. So this is how our topic here is broken down. We're going to look at some benefits and harms of computers. We're going to look at uh, data and privacy, to do with privacy of you know, what data is held and kept about us. We're going to look at the legal implications. That's a small unit. We're going to look at computer security as in terms of things that could make our computers insecure or uh, cause us harm. And then we're going to look at encryption or protecting our data. And there's a number of ways that we can protect data, such as passwords, but obviously more than just passwords. So let's look at the first one, digital divide. This concept, and it's a very high level abstract concept, is a divide between people who have computers and who don't. Now, let's take your, your life, for example. In your life, do you have someone who maybe, if you imagine as a student, someone who has access to ChatGPT to help them write their essay versus someone who doesn't? That's a huge advantage even if, you, if your teacher doesn't catch you. But let's say you have, re, even as you just use it for research, you can use it as a tool, it's pretty powerful. Now let's even imagine that you don't have access to any computer versus someone who does. How are they gonna research their essay? They're gonna go to the library, look up a book, ask their parents, ask their, their grandparents. Uh, there's a limit, right? Without a computer, you can't get that much done. 
whereas with a few keystrokes you can get a lot done with a computer. This is known as a digital divide, that if we have groups in society who have computers and other groups that don't, then we're going to see society start to split apart. And so that is what the digital divide is all about. Comparing some people who have access, some people don't, we don't want our society to, to, to become into like these two separate uh, levels. Like we want everyone to have equal opportunities. So we have to consider, even in our society, which you know we assume that we have, like everyone has the same rights that we do or ha has the same access that we do, but maybe in some schools, here in, even in Taiwan, people don't have the same access that we do. Maybe they have, maybe live in the mountains, they don't get cell service. Maybe they, there's no Wi-Fi provider in their area. You know, there's a lot of different reasons why people may have limited access. So we, we're constantly trying to think of ways that we can make our technology more accessible. Now, a lot of the internet is in English. That is an access problem for people who don't speak English. So we have to do, we have to really consider that it's not just us and our friends who are going to be using stuff. But if we develop something, we have to keep in mind that it's a big world and that uh, other people want to access things. All right? Uh, and we watched a video about that. That was, that was pretty good. Uh, here, there's a bunch of ways that, and it's not just economic, but there's a bunch of ways that we can have a digital divide. We talked about, for example, geographical, maybe not having a like, service in rural area versus in the cities. We could talk about that in terms of countries too, like some countries don't have great internet access. Some countries have really great internet access. Okay, So all the IT jobs obviously are going to be in the first world countries. Uh, if you are, a, you know, if you're a kid coming up in a in a country where there's not much access, how are you going to learn how to program? How are you going to get one of those great jobs? Okay, things like that. But other reasons might be something like culture, like language, as I mentioned. It could be just your family background. You don't put much emphasis on technology. It could be a social thing, like age or disability. Uh, it could be related to economics, right? Not having money for computers. Maybe your school doesn't have the money to buy computers, to have a computer lab. So there's a bunch of different ways that we can see our places become divided. All right. I'm going to skip this question because uh, this you can pause the video if you like. Uh, what is not a consequence of of digital disparity in online access and this is talking about a consequence okay so this is the key word here consequence and so that's a right this is the reason why there may be a disparity in the future so that's the the um the reason the cause but not a consequence right so this is this is the reason why some areas may not have internet access but it's not the result of not having internet access. Um, which of the following is an effect the digital divide has on the given groups? So it's usually talking about things where uh, the effects are things that, uh, it's not that people can not do things because teachers can still grade work even though they don't have a computer. Mathematicians can still work out calculus, but it's, it's not that we can't do things, it's just that they're going to take time or they're going to have a harder time and cause uh, people to get behind, right? So it's things like that. Students might be able to have trouble accessing resources. All right, let's talk about bias, okay? Because now this different topic, uh, computing bias is how computers can be... Uh, it's, it's almost like how can a computer have an opinion on something? A bias is a tendency to be one-sided on a certain particular topic. Now we all have biases. We all have we have con cognitive biases, and people, in different ways, can be uh, biased in some ways. For example, like they may only watch a certain kind of news program, and then they have all their opinions are confirmed 
by the news that they watch. And they watch the news and say, oh, yeah, that, that news tells me that I'm right. So they only watch the news that tells them that they're right. They never watch something that tells them they're wrong. So that's cognitive bias. Um, yeah, and there's a few different ways that we can be biased. Computers can also suffer the same thing. So these are the, all the list of biases that people can have. But computers uh, can also have bias. And so there has been a debate on ChatGPT, for example, as one example of being biased. And it was politically biased in terms of it liked certain parties or certain politicians as opposed to other politicians. And so there have been tests that people have done. For example, they ask about the political leanings and they don't have political bias. It says it doesn't have political bias, but then when they do test it on the political score, they find that, yeah, it does lean into a certain category, right? Now, why is this? Well, why did it become that way? Well, it helps to know that is it coincidence that this this bias here, or this kind of political alignment, matches the alignment of many of the people who designed it. That it's quite well known that in the in that uh, kind of in Silicon Valley, a lot of people are very left or libertarian in their thinking. You won't find many people on uh, in different pol uh, political things. Now, is it because that's the the one correct political opinion to have? doubtful it just means that the things that they've chosen maybe even they weren't even aware of it but they chose the inputs and the data to feed the the algorithm they chose things that match their own beliefs even subconsciously uh, and you can you can test this out if you want to go ask it to write a story about uh, some particular candidate you can go and find that it does have some it's happy to do it in some cases. It's not happy to do it in other cases. It's also been programmed to avoid using racial slurs, maybe to the detriment of, maybe in the bias it has is to protect or not to say anything rude, but that's that could be a problem. In this case, who cares what ChatGPT says, really? But if this was an AI that was controlling something very important, like controlling the world, let's say, in, in the future, that would be a cause for concern. Like if it's not willing to save the world because it, it's gonna, it, doesn't, it wants to avoid offending one person, that's a bit of a problem. Uh, and so uh, there is some, some issues here where what is the bias? If, if, you, if you're driving a, a self-driving car and the car is faced with the, either hitting a young person or an old person, there's no other way to avoid it, what's it going to choose? Is, there, is, that a, is it a right choice to make? Is it Should it be random? These are some issues of bias. Is it going to have a bias against older people? So there are, there are lots of uh, ways that we have to consider that technology is going to have some kind of process in which it decides what's good and what's bad. Okay? Uh, and so... The reason for, I mean, basically when we look at AI, and this, this is a bit of an aside, but AI is basically a series of weightings or scores given to certain words, categories, inputs, that kind of stuff. And so a score is given to all these little dots here. And depending on what the input is, that score might either make it go this way or these different scores will get added up and it will decide which is the best result right and so you can see that uh, by these weights get trained over time and it starts to process things like a brain would right uh, our brains are, are kind of similar they the neurons which light up and connect to each other so um, the training depends on what the inputs have trained it on and, and have trained it just to be like so basically an AI system is just a series of these weights which come in so it's really it's quite, quite an interesting thing to see that these weights are, are the basis of the AI, but somehow it gets smart because of that, right? Now, we are also a bunch of weights and biases based on our history and, and, and prior knowledge, but uh, this is how they work. And so when people are training these systems, they may be introducing bias through the way that they're training them. It's not that they program it in. 
It's just that they give it some data and they train it on data that they may agree with. Okay, so the, the way that these systems are generated may introduce bias even if it's un, unconsciously. Okay, all right. So, uh, that's bias. Now, uh, in this video we watched, we, we saw a video about how uh, this researcher was uh, using a face recognition algorithm which didn't recognize her face. Uh, because she was black and these algorithms had been trained on faces that were white uh, or Asian, uh, and so they it didn't recognize it unless you put on a mask. And so because of the training, it had a bias in the data. So that's how bias can be introduced. It's not that it's overt racism or things like that, that it gets programmed in. It's that it gets trained on a, a limited subset of, of data, which doesn't include the wider variety of data. So we have to be aware when we're testing things, when we're creating things, we have to be aware of like testing on a wide range of, of circumstances. So, uh, now this is talking about machine learning. So what we were looking at AI, there was machine learning. That is, uh, what, this is what, what effect has machine learning had on all its, on its given fields? Uh, it's had an effect on all of these fields. So that's the answer there. Uh, all of these fields. Okay, machine learning is going to have a big impact on our world, hopefully for the better, in all these areas. Um, here's a question about a running tracker, and it's asking, um, it's talking about bias, what's going to introduce bias? Now, bias would be something where people are excluded, or it's going to only focus on you know one area or something like that. And so in this case, organizing big runs in a major city would be introducing bias because then people in rural areas would be left out. Okay, let's turn to digital uh, privacy. So as you go about your business, you're surfing the internet, you're doing your thing, you're leaving breadcrumbs around. You're leaving not just cookies, but you're leaving little bits of personally identifiable information. And you may not even be aware of it. But little bits about what you're doing is getting recorded in a database somewhere. On each of the sites, that data may be shared between sites, but it's being used to track you. And why? Why would someone want to track you? Well, mostly for advertising, but it could be for many reasons. And the, the thing is that we have to be aware that what we do online is often recorded, even down to the little things you click on or hover over or time you spend looking at something. And behind the scenes, that data is getting collected and saved. Now, how do they know it's you? What if you're just using, uh, you know, you're not even signed in to your account? How do they know it's you? Well, they may collect stuff like your IP address. They may collect stuff like your browser version, your your ID, your the the ID of your your uh, device, and many other things. And so, based on that, they may be able to figure it out. They may be able to at least just track your device and know that your device, uh, you know, is uh, something that it's it's known, right? So, in many ways, uh. Websites and companies using apps are tracking what you're doing. If you're using apps like, which require a lot of uh, access, like if you're using apps that require your camera, your GPS, your uh, storage, hey, who knows what it's collecting? It may be collecting a lot of information, right? Even the, the, the gyroscope, which is inside, which detects w which direction your phone's in or if your phone's moving, they use that, okay? So there's a lot of, lot of ways that things are being tracked, okay? Can you delete it? Uh, in many cases, no. Uh, in many cases, it's saved in that site for a long time. So when we do stuff, we are kind of... Uh, Creating data, and often many companies are using that data to make a personalized experience for us. But they're also using it for advertising, tracking, 
and that kind of stuff. So we call this stuff PII, Personally Identifiable Information. And it usually is describing you or something about you. Now, the th if you're talking about your name or your date of birth or phone number, that's, that's very much uh, personally identifiable information. That anything which describes you, uh, information about you, that is information which you should be protecting and should be very careful about sharing that online. Okay? So, for example, we have phone number, age, race, ID, biometric data, financial information, that kind of stuff shouldn't be shared easily. It should be very private. Uh, in the wrong hands, personally identified PII, let's say PII, this can be used to stalk, exploit, or even steal identities. Okay, so the, the serious implications, if you have even a, a few pieces of this information, it can be used to get more information, right? So you consider not just one piece, like, that, you know, it's not like they have to own the whole set to, to, to do it. You can use one to get another one, right? And you'd be surprised at how much information might be out there that a hacker could use or people could research and find out about you. A stalker might be able to find out about you know exactly maybe they could look up your phone number maybe they could find you find your age your birthday and then use that to find more information okay so uh, we talked about this now cookies are basically local storage of information small text files which get saved by your browser which saves information about what you've been doing on that site it's usually just a little bit of information like it could be just your your session id maybe the the website has a special id for your session so it remembers like what's in your shopping cart and you, when you when it looks up that cookie later it can read the cookie and say oh this this was the session id so it can restore that information from its site it's usually not all the details about what's in your shopping cart it might just be an id but it links it back to you that, that you can sort of remember things. So websites save cookies regularly, and that's normal. Like, they save stuff about <clears throat> what you've been doing so they can remember you later. Uh, but this information does allow for recognition of what you've been doing. And so uh, that's how, like, advertisers and things can kind of track you across your uh, web surfing, even across, you know, days and weeks. And you can sort of, um, you know, marketing firms might be using these, even if you're not using that same site. Even if you're just using Facebook, a marketing company may have paid Facebook some money to be able to access that data of, like, what you're interested in, what kind of topics you like. On Instagram especially, like, you know, it's very much marketing. Uh, a lot of marketing goes in there. So if you're clicking on stuff, you know, which has, like, let's say, for example, you click on stuff that has, I don't know, let's say socks and you're always clicking on stuff that has socks in it well they start selling sending you ads for socks or shoes or whatever it is so that that kind of thing that can be used for advertising it's a money maker for a lot of sites and so you'll find that every site has these kind of things i mean they they you can look in the privacy policy of many sites and find out about how they're sharing but you'll find that most of them are sharing that data and they're making money from, from sharing that data. So that's data about you that they're sharing with other advertising companies. All right. So you can look in your own time at the websites and privacy policies, and maybe you'll learn some things about how they're sharing your data. Now that people have become more aware of it, they're a bit better with handling data, and they allow you the options to delete it sometimes. But they usually have a clause in there which says we'll have to keep it for legal reasons or something like that. So uh, just be aware that uh, they're collecting information. If you're using TikTok, they're collecting a lot of information about you. All right. Um, so uh, this is the stuff that you should be trying to keep safe. You Ideally, you wouldn't be sharing any of this information. Uh you want you know you don't want to have all this information this is an example of PII 
So it's very important uh, to keep your privacy because it can be used against you. And so we just have to be aware of that. Okay. So I just need you to be aware of what is PII and how to keep it safe. Okay. Uh, so let's skip through there. Okay. All right. So this is a question about uh, a police department is installing security cameras around the streets uh, and it could store license plate data from cars that are driven and parked. But what might happen? Could it be that um, if someone wanted to, they might be able to look at the movements of city residents? What if you use those cameras to then track certain people and say, oh, I wonder what they're up to. What were they doing at lunchtime? Can I use that information against them? Oh, they seem to be visiting this person here. Oh, I wonder what they were doing. And so, etc. right? You can see how this could be misused. So it's one thing to have a, a you know, security for, and, and police can have access to it, but police are people too. So we have to be aware of privacy and also security. It's usually a, a bit of a trade-off between the two, privacy versus security. Okay, here's an anonymous browser that's been opened and uh, it's asking about uh, cookies. Now, when you open an anonymous session, like an incognito session, private browsing mode, it will delete those cookies after you finish. But it's possible that the network can still see what you're doing just because a cookie is going to be deleted. And so the record of what you've been doing is deleted. And there's no history in your in your browser. There's no history, but still the people on the network can see what you're doing. And so therefore, uh, it's not truly, you know, anonymous. Um, so yeah, sure. If you're using that same computer, you may not be able to see what the user has been doing, but someone on the network monitoring the traffic would know. <coughs> so. The, the true thing is that if you're using a shopping cart, then yeah, that stuff will not be saved because the cookie will be deleted. So that's the true thing. Okay. All right, so here's the kind of sliding scale of privacy and uh, security. Uh, you may be somewhere on that scale. Now, let's turn to legal implications. Legal implications are about what is intellectual property and who owns digital work. Now, it's very easy to copy stuff uh, on the computer. You just go Control-C, Control-V, bang, you copied it. Is that legal? Is that ethical? Will you get in trouble for it? Yes, possibly. Uh, and so what we're going to look at is what are the systems for protecting property? Uh, and intellectual property is real. I mean, if you work... For a week on a project and someone comes in and control c control v and steals your work that's not exactly fair some companies are working and spending millions of dollars on research uh here in taiwan you know companies are spending millions of dollars on research trying to develop new um you know new algorithms or design new chips and then someone swoops in and and tries to steal it and they send it to another company, which then starts to use it. Now, did it cost anything? Did it go Control C, Control V? No. Right? It didn't cost anything to copy it, but it cost millions of dollars to make it. And so, protecting intellectual property is, is important as protecting your your physical property. So, what we want to be able to do is have a system for protecting this, and ultimately. You know, this is, it's not that you can protect someone from copying stuff. I mean, they've tried very hard to, to prevent, they've tried very hard to prevent uh, people from being able to copy things, but it's very difficult. You know, it's, if it's a file, it's very easy to replicate. But this is more about a legal, from a legal point of view. Okay. So, um, 
we are looking at ways to protect things. And so let's take the example of uh, pictures. Uh, if you have, make a picture, you make a digital artwork, uh, how do you protect it or how do you, you say that it's, it's yours as an artist? So the Creative Commons system is kind of similar to the copyright system, but it's, it's basically a whole system of of levels of how much you can share something okay so these different licenses provide uh, they're, they're set by the artist the creator for the level at which they think that people can use it and as an example um, oops you may for example like not want anyone to be able to change your work at all right so they can't change it they can't modify it they have to just sell it as is if they want to use it they have to uh, ask for a license right so there you know these these levels may may specify that so here they they can't modify and adapt it uh, and but they can use it for commercial use so that would be CC by ND right they can copy and publish they can they have to say that it was from you the artist they can use it in their commercial use, like maybe put it on a t-shirt and sell it, but they can't go and change it. For example, if you did a picture of uh, a, a cute cat, but then they decided to make that cute cat a smoking cat and that cat had a cigarette, that would be against the license, right? Whereas if it was this license, CC by NC, they can copy and publish it, they could use attribution, but they couldn't, they weren't allowed to sell it. They could modify it, but they won't be allowed to sell it. So to get that kind of license, there might be a, like this one, CC by SA, they can copy, they can they can say it's from you, they have to, uh, they can use it commercially, but they can also modify it. So different licenses for different things, and this Creative Commons was designed as a system to be uh, more, um, kind of easier to navigate with a better system and require less, less uh, need for lawyers as well at the top here the public domain system i mean that's that's the the, the most the most free system right it means that you can copy and publish you can use it commercially modify it change it whatever you can do it and want everything you don't have to even say it's attribute you don't even have to say who the artist was public domain is the most open right if something's in the public domain, then anyone can use it and modify it. So, that's sort of uh, that's sort of the the system. You don't have to remember all of these, but you do have, at least have to know what it's about. It's designed to kind of make a uh, an easier system, right? So this is very very public over here, public domain. Creative Commons has a bunch of different restrictions, and copyright you usually has. Uh, much tighter restrictions if it's copyright then you really have to get permission from the artist if you want to reuse it in any way okay so that's generally the yeah just remember this broad spectrum and sort of understand what what they're trying to do okay all right on to security security uh there's many ways uh, basically it's about protecting ourselves from bad actors bad software uh, things which will compromise our computer. Okay, so let's look at how uh, software or people can get unauthorized access to computing resources. And let's look at a few different kinds of malicious software and how we can protect them. So, uh, let's look at keyloggers. Okay, keyloggers are basically pieces of software which record your keystrokes and it's usually a secret piece of software that's running in the background hidden from view but it saves everything you type and everything you sometimes even screenshots and things like that and it sends them to the attacker secretly obviously it's uh, maybe sends an email with a, a list you know a, a list of all the things you've been typing so obviously this is breaching the security of you know what we think is private our private typing it's recording keystrokes that's not good so 
um, a keylogger is a piece of software which is getting around that somehow. Okay, uh, it could basically steal everything you're typing, everything you push. So passwords, sensitive information could be seen. Uh, it could be software or or hardware based, and it's. Uh, I guess most virus checkers would pick it up these days, but you have to keep in mind that virus checkers are trying to match certain patterns, and it might be that well-known keyloggers are are able to be caught, like something that you could be you know buying on online easily, uh, you know, would be caught. But what if it's a new piece of software, or what if it's like you know, kind of like unknown or haven't been researched by virus companies? So. This is, uh, you know, it's an issue that someone could stick a USB in your in your computer, and then it could be uh, tracking what you're typing. So th this is a keylogger. Okay. Um, so, warning signs. How would you know? Well, the thing is that you probably wouldn't know. The idea of a keylogger is to hide in the background and be like a program that's running. You don't even know. Uh, so it's very difficult to catch that. Now you could go on to your. Uh, I mean, you you could sort of have a, a look at the task manager. Now every computer has a kind of a task manager, and I'll try and show you if I can. A task manager would look something like this. Uh, on Windows, it looks like this, and here's me running my tasks. But in the background, there may be a task that's running. Some Now, there's many little tasks that are running. We don't really know even what they are. But, for example, what's Pell service? I don't know what that is. Hmm. Is that a keylogger? And then you can start to get a bit uh, paranoid. What is this? Mouse Suite 98 Daemon? What's that? And you can start to wonder, well, do I have a keylogger on my system? <laughs> what's this thing? Right? Uh, and so this is what a keylog would do. It would sit in the background, it would be running, and you wouldn't really know. So we have to obviously try and avoid getting a keylog in the first place by not running unauthorized software, but also run virus checks or check our computer to make sure that nothing's been installed and that we are up to date with our virus, uh, antivirus software. Okay. Also, if you're seeing your computer start to be a bit slow or like thinking a lot or the little mouse cursor turns into a thinking icon a lot, it may mean that something's happening in the background regularly. All right. Okay, so I'm going to skip this question. I don't think we need to do that. Phishing. Let's talk about phishing because phishing is something that happens probably the most uh, where you're often getting emails about well, they look they look real but they're not uh, i always get you know uh, messages on my phone from say pick up a package you please follow this link to pick up the package and it's not really from the postal company it's from some hacker who's trying to get information so what is phishing phishing is using something that the user trusts in order to get something else Usually it's your login details or your bank account number or something like that. It's trying to get some kind of personal data, some PII. So in this case, it's using the trust that we have for Adobe, knowing that it's a, it's a public company, we know what PDFs are, and this may seem like an Adobe sign-in screen. Now, maybe the person clicked here on a PDF file that they want to read and it might be a really interesting PDF and they really want to get it in to read it but they had to put in their email address so they just go ahead and type it now this Adobe ID is not going to go to Adobe if it goes in here when they click there it's going to go to this whatever whoever the hacker was and they will be able to read what the ID was and then they can use that ID and password to then log into the Adobe account maybe buy software, maybe do other things. So in this case, um, it's it's clearly using that trust of Adobe uh, to get the user to type in the email, the password. Okay, 
So how, how do you know? Well, that arrow shows you that that is not Adobe. That's not an Adobe site. And so therefore, we shouldn't be trusting that uh, login. Here's another one. This is from a, what looked like a power company or a kind of it was a kind of an online bill. And if you were to click on this online bill or download the PDF, that may contain some kind of key logging software or virus, uh, which you can get onto your computer. So another one. Seems like it's a regular bill. It's not. Okay. Uh, so phishing is all about using trust. Okay. The security risk is that you're going to give up information which you shouldn't be giving up. And we should be very aware of the address that we're going to. We should be aware of the email address that we're that, that's sending that information. And it can often come from trusted contacts as well. So if someone gets hacked, they might use your friend's email to send the message, right? And so we do have to be a little bit aware that uh, phishing is usually using some kind of trust. It could be a relationship that you have. It could be uh, something that you recognize. Some kind of trust. All right. And so this question is about if you receive an email from an insurance company and it says to click a link to learn more, what would be the, uh, how would we know it's phishing? Well, if you said, um, it's not about keystrokes, it's, if you click the link in the web page open that asks the recipient for personal information, that would be the answer, right? You open a web page and it asks you to add, enter some kind of information like please enter your password to continue you got to be very careful right a lot of screens now when you go to log into something it asks you to log in with your with your you know google account or something like that and so you need to be aware that is this really google that i'm at you know that i'm signing into is it really the google site or is it another site that's pretending to be google all right, a rogue access point. Rogue access points are, are basically uh, web uh, Wi-Fi networks that have been added to a regular network, and they're not they're not part of the regular network, right? So, this is like plugging in a, a home router into your corporate network, and then people can access that home router and get access to the corporate network. So, like, like a kind of a tunnel into the network. So, a rogue access point is basically an unauthorized access point into a network it, it's going to use a wired connection here to connect to the corporate network and bypass the security the normally a wi-fi has security right you have a student's wi-fi and it has a student you know as the password but the that's security but if you just plugged in a home router to the, the network maybe you could have it open and no password and no firewall maybe even right so that's rogue access points. Let's get on to viruses and malware. Um, viruses and malware are basically just software. It's a piece of code which is designed to do something bad to your computer. Um, viruses can can attach themselves to programs that seem okay. You could just run that pr program and it may be it runs and it's like something happens and it looks like it's just a normal program. But actually what was happening was another piece of code was in that program and it was attached to it, and then it started to attack your system. Um, so it's it's usually designed to damage your computer or take control of it. Okay, so if you're downloading software online, you have to be aware that sometimes software has other software, and it won't pop up in your screen. It'll just be in the background running its stuff. Um, so it can often be found in free or pirated software online. You have to download from trusted sources. Now, app stores try and avoid, you know, get around this. App stores scan things before they get added to the app store. That's why they're somewhat protected there. But if you're just downloading software from the internet and running them, you have to be aware that it, it's possible to get uh, viruses that way. All right. You can use virus checking software, but it doesn't always work. So... Usually, uh, this viruses and malware will damage your system. It might lock your computer up. It may cause your computer to reboot endlessly. Sometimes they're very hard to get rid of. Okay. 
Um, so let's review. Phishing was tricking and getting getting personal information or access. Keylogging was recording all your keystrokes. Malware is software which is designed to damage your computer. And rogue access points were unauthorized wireless uh, access points. Okay, so those are the, the big topics. All right, let's uh, skip that video. Let's skip that one. And let's go about protecting our data. Authentication and cryptography. So uh, when you're sending data through the internet, it's a series of ones and zeros. We learned that in the networking unit. But those ones and zeros, well, let's say if someone was to look at those, could they see what you were sending? If it was just in like regular, um, let's say ASCII, code so that your you know your the sequence of bits was this one for an a and one for a b and then eventually could they decode all of those bits into a message well it's possible if you didn't if you didn't have a way of locking up that data and making sure it was hidden and so authentic uh, sorry about, cryptography is a way to lock our data up in a in a sort of a way that no one else can unlock it and so we call this encryption so, encryption is kind of like uh, secret coding, right? And making a secret code to send a message. So let's look at this one, okay? Now this is a really basic code which locks up the message. And, uh, you know, it's, I'll say it's not very difficult because it's really just using an algorithmic shift, of the alphabetic shift, sorry. Uh, it all it does is shifts the letters along a certain number of characters. So instead of like it's not as simple as A becomes B, B becomes C, but it's something like that. And so if you change every letter by thirteen, you realize that this message is actually just A becomes N and B becomes O, etc., etc. And that was the that was the message. So it wouldn't have taken that long to decipher the code. This is called a Caesar cipher. It was used probably during Roman times, but uh, not very effective. Only if you're really in a rush and you just you just want to stop people from figuring out for a few few minutes, maybe. Uh, so yeah, that's the that's the Caesar cipher shift. But modern cryptography is much more complicated. Okay. So the idea of encryption is to make a code to attach your message to all right and now what we're doing here is if you imagine that we shift each letter of our message so instead of like this one where we shift it by 13 each single time what if we shift it by a variable amount of uh, numbers so what if we were to like say i don't know let's let's say we have a word like Apple, okay? And so if A is number one, let's say I shift the first letter by one. So S, uh, sorry, F, the F in free pizza becomes a G, right? Because I've shifted it by one. And then my, my key is Apple, right? So the next one is P. So I shift the next letter by P amount. Now, P is like, uh, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, 16. So I shift the next letter by 16. So R gets shifted by 16 letters, right? And then it's so, it's, and so on and so on forth. And if I just use Apple and I shift them by, by the 1 and then 13 and then 13, and the, oh, sorry, 15 and 15, and I shift it by that varying amount, then that's known as having a key or a kind of a, a cipher, right? So it's like the Caesar cipher, but it's it's using a variable amount of shifts, right? And I just keep repeating that apple, 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 shifting by apple each time, right? So we can use a cipher in a similar way to lock up things. Now, how long is the cipher? Well, that depends on how much, how many bits you want to use. If you want to use a lot of bits, you can you can make a really complicated cipher to lock up your code. If someone has that cipher and they know exactly what that secret cipher is, then they'll be able to decrypt it. But you can see 
how much more complicated that is. In the previous example, you just had to figure out that it was like 13. So you could like test every letter, shift it by one, shift it by two, shift it by three, shift it by four, and eventually you're gonna get this, this word, right? Even if you just tested it on VA and kept shifting and shifting and shifting, you could figure out pretty quickly that you get in, and that would maybe work out to a real word, right? So that would be a quick way you could figure that out quickly, but if each shift was different, each, each letter got shifted by a different amount, as in using that other cipher, then it was much more strong. And so your cipher can really make your encryption much stronger. Then you have to figure out what, what's the secret word that they're, they're locking it up with. So actually, a cipher might look like this, this one in the middle. And if you imagine, instead of Apple as my cipher, I'm using this really complicated non-word with symbols and everything. And it got shifted by this amount, by this amount, and this amount. So let's say I have all these different shifts that I can use, and it repeats and repeats and repeats and locks up my message. Then I can basically uh, lock up my message in a really complicated way, but a computer would be able to encrypt it and decrypt it. Okay, so encryption is the process of making it into a secret message, and decryption is the process of unlocking it or making it back to the original message. This is not related to compression, which is trying to make a message smaller. This is trying to make a message uh, secure and unable to be read by only, or only able to be read by people who have the key. So, given we know this now, Let's look at different forms of encryption. It would be a little bit easy if, if you were to give your key away to someone else, right? Let's, so let's say I want to send my friend a secret message. And I say, hey, listen, I'm going to send you an email. And one email has got the key in it, right? So you can use that key to unlock my message. And then another email I'll send to my friend will have that, that secret message with, that's locked up. And then they'll be able to use that key and decrypt the message. But now what happens if someone has access to their email? Well, now they've got the message and they find out the key. And it's kind of tough. They, they unlocked it straight away. So if someone has access to that key and they can find out the key, then they kind of got the, uh, the whole thing. You might send the message. Maybe you send the key on their phone and then you send the, the message on the email. But if someone gets access to the phone, similar thing. It's, it's still problematic. If you've got the key, you can unlock the message, no matter who you are. So introduce, let's introduce this form of encryption. Public key encryption. Now this is better because this is uh, interesting in the fact that you use a different key to unlock it than you do to lock it. So you can use one key to lock the key and uh, to lock the, the, the message, right? And that's known as the public key. You can give that key away to anybody and they can lock up a message, but they won't be able to unlock the message. So even if they have that key, they won't know how to unlock a message. So it's really interesting because you can use that key, you can lock the message, and then only you has the private key which can unlock the message and decrypt the message, right? So all you do is you send that public key to whoever you want to give you the message. They're going to write the message, encrypt it, and they send you the encrypted message. You can use your private key to decrypt it, and only you can do that. It's pretty cool. What it is, it's like a mailbox, kind of, a, and we did see a video here uh, about that, but it's kind of like a mailbox that, uh, has two slots, right? Someone can open it up and put the letter in, right? They can put the letter in, but only you can unlock it and get them, the letters out. And so that's the difference between what we call symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption, right? So you have to remember these two terms, symmetric and asymmetric or public key encryption. So public key and asymmetric key encryption are basically the same or like uh, public key encryption is, is kind of the example of asymmetric key encryption, where the asymmetric meaning they're not the same. Symmetric meaning both sides of these, the same, right? Same key, different keys here. 
Okay. So that's the key. That that's the uh, the key. Uh, I wasn't trying to be funny there. Uh, this is the idea behind um, encryption. We're trying to protect data. And so what you'll find is that uh, in all of your apps, if you're using encryption, like in Line, you will have a, a, a public key that you're sharing in your Line messages. Behind the scenes, of course, you're not aware of it, but you can actually see your, your public key. And other, you can see your friend's public key. And when you send them a message, usually you're encrypting it with their public key. And they will decrypt it with their private key. All right, so what would pose the greatest security risk when using public key encryption? Exposure of the public key. Exposure of the private key. Open standards for encrypting data. Or encrypted message being intercepted by a third party. Well, the point of encryption is that we don't care if someone in intercepts our message because they can't read it. Only if they have the key. Now, which key? In terms of public key encryption, we know that there's two different keys. One's public, one's private. So the really, we don't care if everyone has a public key because that's how they encrypt the message and, and, and put it into the code, but they can't use that to get to decrypt the message and, and reveal the, the secrets, right? It's only the private key which we need to be worried about protecting. That's the security risk there. So as long as you keep the private key private, you're fine. Okay, I think this is... Um, one of the one of the ways that uh, encryption is used is to protect websites. And so, when you see this lock icon, you may have wondered what it was. The lock icon is referring to how a, a website can encrypt the the data as it as it's sending back and forth. So, as you're sending your email, obviously, like you're sending your email through the internet, you don't want that email to be uh, spied on as you're sending it through, right? Otherwise, when you type out your email and click send, that goes through to the Gmail or wherever your email address is. That information could be going through the internet and then get spied on on the way as it as it bounces around through the internet. You don't want that. You don't want someone sniffing the packets and, and knowing what's going on in your emails. So websites provide a way to lock the site, as in you, when, you, when you're when you sending that data, it's going to get locked up with the public key for that website, right? And then it's going to get uh, done. Now, who maintains or a certificate is basically a, a record of uh, that kind of key or that that website has an official key and it's coming from that website. And a certificate authority is basically a, a kind of a... A company that validates these these certificates or these kind of keys that the key that you're locking it with is the real key for that site and so if you're seeing the lock sign it means that it's validated if you see this sign where it's not locked it means that the the certificate doesn't match with the website right and so there's a problem and that's usually why you get that error Okay, but it has to do with encryption of the data and making sure that the key that you're locking that data up with is the correct one, up to date. Okay, and so you can you can sort of watch videos about that too. Um, so digital certificates are used to verify. Uh, so this is which one of these is it true? Digital certificates are used to verify the ownership of encrypted keys used in secure communication. Digital certificates are used to verify that the connection to the website is fault tolerant. So, one, two, one and two, or neither one or one and two. Well, fault tolerance, we know from our networking questions that this is, you know, encryption is not related to fault tolerance. Fault tolerance is about the, do we have backup ways to get to the website? Is there another server that we can go if the server breaks? That's not related to encryption, right? Digital certificates are about encryption and protecting the data as we're sending it. So it should be one only. All right, passwords. Let's talk about passwords because uh, obviously we know that we should use strong passwords. Why? Well, computers are getting pretty fast. And if they just guessed 
A A A A A A A and then B B B B B B B and and kept on doing all the combinations of letters, they could probably figure it out. They could probably crack your password pretty quickly. So that's why we asked you to use long passwords and passwords that are not in dictionaries because dictionaries can be we can we can load a dictionary into our memory and they just scan every single word. So if you use a if you use a password that's in the dictionary, guaranteed it can find the the answer really quick. Like a computer could scan like millions of combinations per second. So that's that that's all the letters like all the words in the dictionary are done right in a few seconds. So therefore, we ask try and use long passwords. Try and use combinations of letters, numbers uppercase lowercase symbols that kind of thing and so you can use that site to check your password security so should be easy to remember but difficult for someone to guess right right so now let's say you use a good password but someone has a keylogger on your computer and they recorded what your password was how can you protect yourself then if someone was using a camera to like secretly record you while you entered your password what about then there's a bunch of issues there right so how do we really protect ourselves what's a really effective way to protect ourselves in this modern day and age where it's hard to know who's watching you while you're typing so just a password by itself is known as single factor authentication it's one way to authenticate you type in your password you log in this is something that you remember, and it's something that you know. But what, we, what we're trying to do now is to move to a bit of a more complicated system, yes, but it's much more effective, and that's to use multi-level authentication, or MLA. Okay, So this is the idea, and you've used it before. Trust me, you've, I'm, I'm sure you've all used it where you get a notification on your phone that's asking is this you signing in and therefore you have to use your phone and to say yes that's me and then you're granted access so it's not just one login it's not just something that you remember but it's also maybe something that you have with you multi-factor authentication tries to use multiple ways to authenticate you in order to protect you from a hacker just say stealing your password most sites are using that now and you can enable it in some cases you have no choice in some cases you have the choice whether to enable that and usually these are the three ways three different levels that we have to authenticate it might be something you know like your password right you remember it it might be something you have with you that you carry around maybe it's your phone Maybe it's uh, uh, like a key, like sometimes it has like a, uh, um, a portable key that people can carry around with them. And therefore, and, and the other one, it might be something that you are inherent. So it's something that you have or that you are like your fingerprint, your iris scan, your face scan, something that you, you have on your body that's part of you, right? So combining all these three things you actually get a, a lot more security and it's very hard to to crack. Um, so, this is an example of multi-factor authentication. So, every time you add another layer, you get another layer of security. All right, um, software updates. Now, many of you may delay your updates because you don't want to have to restart your system or you don't want to have to like wait for this to load or download or whatever it is and you got updates waiting for you uh, sometimes computers won't want to wait too long for these updates to happen but I've heard it said that you know I've seen computers where people have said oh, I don't know what's wrong with my computer and they've got updates from a year ago that should be downloaded uh, in their app store they've got tons of updates waiting the reason why they update software is to to block errors, yes, or fix errors. Maybe it's to release some new features, but often it's security holes which haven't been filled yet. And researchers will always be finding these errors or holes 
in the software where there's like a security flaw and those can be fixed but you need to download the update so keeping your software updated often helps uh, to keep your system protected from these uh, these security flaws when someone finds a security flaw in the software it means it's like a back door like like some for example like let's say you have a house and there's a window that's unlocked and then they release an update to say okay well we, we suggest you get this new kind of window that can't be easily unlocked well what if you don't get that window for a while now everyone knows that there is a problem with the windows so hackers can then use that error or that flaw to get access to your house right so therefore running your updates is protecting your system okay here's a question about multi-factor authentication uh, here we go each employee of a company is issued a USB device that contains a unique token code to log into a company computer and an employee must insert the USB device into the computer and provide a correct password now does this example have multi-factor? Well, yes, it does, because not only it has something they remember, like a password, something they know, but it has something that they carry with them, right? And that's the USB device. So yes, that is. Uh, so, But we're looking for one that's not. After logging into an account from a new device, a user must enter a code that is sent via email to the email address on file. Yes. Again, that's logging in to they're logging in using the password, but they're also have to like that's something that they have. Uh, their email is like a separate thing that they have, right? So they have to respond. So that's multi-factor. Uh, a password and a fingerprint. Yes, that is because they remember something, a password, and they also have something that they have or that, that they are right something that they are so that is their fingerprint when a user enters an incorrect password more than two times the user is locked out of the account for 24 hours that's not multi-factor that's just a delay so it's d that's the example of not multi-factor authentication okay i won't go through the quiz uh with this session this was just a review but hopefully that gave you a little bit of an idea about how to uh, tackle this topic. And I'll leave it there. Thanks for watching. Bye.